So, you guys, have, you know, you've been, I guess, walking through the book of Acts. And so you've seen how the number of disciples exploded. Like in the first, let's say, month after Jesus rose from the dead. Um, you saw at the day of Pentecost when uh, the disciples, like when Jesus poured out the Holy Spirit in an especially striking way, um, they all looked like they were covered with flames and they all began speaking in um, different like, languages and everyone could hear them in their own native languages. And that was such a striking display that um, everyone gathered around, thousands of people gathered around, and Peter took the opportunity to share the gospel, and people understood the gospel, they trusted in Jesus, and they became followers of Jesus. And 3,000 were added in one day. Then you saw a little bit later in Acts 3 when um, Peter and John did an awesome miracle in the temple, healing someone who had been lame from birth, who's in his 40s, uh, and they healed him so that he could walk. And again, that was a striking enough miracle that thousands of people gathered, gathered around, and Peter took the opportunity to share the gospel, and then as they heard the gospel, understood the gospel, trusted in the gospel, and followed Jesus, thousands more people were added on that day. And then we read in today's passage, um, verse 1, Now in these days when the disciples were increasing in number, um, so it goes on, the numbers are exploding. God is building his church. Uh, he's using exciting miracles of, um, you know, people covered in fire and uh, awesome miracles and stuff. Um, but that just gets people's attention. What actually adds people to God's church, the, the way that God builds his church, is through the gospel. Um, he's getting people's attention, and then people are sharing the simple truth about Jesus. People are trusting it, following Jesus, and God builds his church. Um, and so that's how God builds his church today. Um, and so, you know, even though I'm here to explain Acts 6, I guess, uh, really, every time a pastor gets up to talk about the Bible, like, what they're really doing is just sharing the simple gospel again. Um, you know, I don't know, maybe some of you haven't grown up in church. I, I assume probably a lot of you have. Um, if you haven't grown up in church, you might not know that you need to be reconciled to the God of the universe. Um, you might not realize that you have been rebelling against the God of the universe your whole life. Um, that you've not been giving him the praise, um, the thanks, the love. You've not made him the center of your life. Um, you've just not treated him the way he deserves. And you have actively rebelled against him many, many, many times. And because of that, and myself included, not just you, um, we deserve his rejection and judgment. And that's bad news. Um, the good news of the gospel, which Peter shared on these occasions, and which you know, a lot of you know, is that Jesus Christ has done everything necessary for you to be reconciled to the God of the universe. Um, Jesus took the rejection and judgment that you deserve for your sins, even though he never sinned, uh, I was going to read a verse to you. 2 Corinthians 5.21 <clears throat> For our sake he made him to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Even though Jesus was not a sinner and never sinned, he was treated <clears throat> as if he was a sinner at the cross. He received what you deserve. And because of that, you receive what he deserves. God treats you when you place your faith in Jesus Christ. God treats you as if you had always given him the love, the praise, the thanks, as if you'd always made him the center of your life. He accepts you and treats you as only his own son deserves. And that's the simple gospel that um, you know, God got everyone's attention to hear, um, but that's, that's the way people are added to God's church, by just understanding the simple gospel, trusting in Jesus Christ, and committing to follow him as his followers for the rest of, it, of your lives. Um, and so, you know, even though I'm here to explain Acts 6, I just invite you to join God's church. <laughs> um, trust the simple gospel and follow Jesus. Okay, so a lot of people are doing that, right? Uh, you guys have seen, as, uh, you know, as the book of Acts began, thousands of people joined the church over about a month-long period and continued to join every day. 
Uh, and the result was an incredible leadership challenge. And so um, just imagine if this group over the course of the next month grew by about 5,000 people. Um, your leaders, I'm sure, are doing a fabulous job, but they would have a leadership challenge if 5,000 people joined over the, over the course of the next month. Um, where would you meet? Uh, would there need to be any structural changes? Um, how would you disciple that many people? You know, what, how, there's so many needs. Like, it, uh, it, it's a leadership challenge. Um, and so that's what the, the disciples were experiencing. The church had exploded. And they were, you know, they were 12 men. <laughs> um, they were trained by Jesus Christ. Uh, they were especially called as his apostles. They were empowered by the Holy Spirit. Um, but 5,000 people joining the church in a very short amount of time is a challenge. And so, honestly, what we see in this passage is they started to drop the ball. Um, and well, I guess one thing I didn't say, they were also, okay, so they were, they were teaching everyone. They were <coughs> praying. Um, they were leading the church. Also, Acts 4, uh, 34 to 35, says that people were selling their lands and houses and uh, bringing their, you know, I guess the proceeds of the sales um, to the apostles. And then the apostles were also in charge of distributing the money to everyone in this, you know, thousands of person uh, church now, um, distributing it according to everyone's needs. And it just became too much. And um, they started to drop the ball in the area of mercy ministry. And we see in this passage that the Greek uh, widows started to be neglected in, um, in the daily distribution of the funds. Um, it wasn't that the apostles didn't like the Greek uh, widows. It was just, holy crap, 5,000 people joined the church. Like, it's a lot to take in. There's a lot to manage. And they, you know, they were just having a hard time <coughs> managing it all. And so um, they came up with a plan. And their plan was basically to establish the first deacons. Um, they chose, well actually they let the congregation choose seven men who would help them as they led the ministry. Um, the apostles would continue to lead and teach and pray, and um, this, these, this new group of deacons um, would, bless you, um, would serve the church in, in practical ways and just take care of the mercy ministry in the church. Um, that was their plan. And that continued to be the pattern for the New Testament church, and it continues to be the pattern today. Um, basically, the apostles, I believe, were only a first century uh, role. Um, Ephesians 2.20 tells us that the church is built on the foundation of the apostles. So I believe that the apostles were just that original group, that they were the foundation of the church, and that we are um, the church on the foundation as we trust in their writings. Um, as we, you know, do everything we do on this foundation of the Bible. Uh, but their role of leadership, of teaching, of prayer, passed to elders. Um, and then this group of deacons, which was in charge of mercy ministry and, and leading the church for their practical needs, um, that, you know, continued to be deacons. And so, ever since, uh, churches have had both elders and deacons. And I'm sure many of your churches, you know, if you have grown up in church, I'm sure your churches have elders and deacons. And if they don't, maybe yes they do. Um, they just call them something else. You know, um, maybe churches call them something else. But every church basically has elders and deacons. It's been the pattern for 2,000 years. Okay. So, God is building his church. Um, and because he's building his church, he has called people to step up and serve in specific ways. He's called people to step up and serve as elders, and he's called people to step up and serve as deacons. And so, basically, I can't preach Act 6 without explaining what those roles are to some extent, because this is one of the main passages where we learn about those roles. Um, but then we're also going to see, like, what does it mean for us? Um, you know, okay, so there's elders, there's deacons, uh, but, like, we are called to serve in the similar ways. Um, just like elders are called to serve, we're called to serve. Just like deacons are called to serve, we're called to serve. So basically, because God is building his church, we must serve in Christ's mission. Um, okay, so first we're going to look at elders. I have to start somewhere. We're going to start with elders. In Acts 6, we see that the apostles knew what they were supposed to focus on. 
Jesus had trained them, right? So in Acts four, I mean, Acts six, um, verse four, the apostles say, "We will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word." Um, so these original apostles knew they were supposed to pray. They couldn't lead people to know Jesus unless they knew Jesus, so they had to spend time in prayer. Um, they were also called to the ministry of the word. They were, you know, um, like Peter, stood up to explain the gospel to thousands of people as the ministry of the word. Um, as the apostles spend time teaching um, God's word so people know how to walk with Jesus. That's the ministry of the word. And then they were called to lead the church. And uh, we're not actually told that in this passage. We just see it. Um, there was a problem, and they solved the problem. They called the group together. They said, let's discuss this problem. Um, you choose people. We'll put them in power. Um, problem solved. They're leading the church. They're saying, address the problem, solve the problem. They're leading the church. So the apostles were called to prayer, to the ministry of the word, and to leadership. And they knew that they weren't supposed to be distracted by other good um, other good things that someone else should do, basically. And that was why they started this new role of deacon, right? Um, it says the reason that they started this new role of deacon, verse 2, it is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Uh, and when, when we hear serve tables, um, we think it's like denigrating this uh, position. Like, they're, they're looking down on, ah, those people just serve tables. Um, we think of maybe like, uh, a waiter, or like um, maybe like the people down in the fellowship hall who who just serve the food, you know. Like we think it's they're like denigrating maybe, but they're not at all. These are incredibly important tables, and they're probably not um, tables in that sense. They're tables in the sense that again, people are giving in our in our terms thousands and thousands of dollars, and some there has to be a location where this money is distributed to the people who need it. And it's probably taking place at tables. So that's probably the tables they're talking about, the tables where the money is distributed. Or maybe they're using the money to buy food, and the tables are the tables where people come to get their weekly rations. Like the deacons are not um, like waiters, basically. Um, this is a very important ministry of the tables. It's just not what the apostles were called to, and they knew it. And so, like I said, the, the role of the apostles of um, prayer, of the ministry of the word, and of leadership has passed now to elders. So, um, I guess first, so I want to I take application from that, basically. Um, you have elders. You know, if you're, if you're part of a church, you have elders. And so the, the first thing we need to do is just um, submit to our elders. Follow well. And so, I guess the first thing I want to say is, if you don't have elders, you need to get some. Um, Christ has determined that you would have elders who would pray for you, who would do the ministry of the word for you, and who would lead you. And if you are not yet a member of a church where elders know they are responsible for you, you need to go and become a member of a church so that elders know they're responsible for you. Um, you need to submit to the leadership that Christ has established for his church by joining a church. You also need to, you know, if, if you do have elders, you need to pray for them and you need to encourage them. Um, they are fallen people just like you and me. They struggle to be Christ-centered. They struggle to be wise. Um, and probably they receive a lot of criticism for all the mistakes they make. And you need to pray for them and you need to encourage them. And also you need to follow intelligently. Um, to submit to someone's leadership doesn't just mean, like, aye, aye. Um, it means follow intelligently. Give them the opportunity to lead, follow, um, but if they're leading the wrong direction, uh, tell them. <laughs> um, follow intelligently. So first, submit to the elders that um, Christ has given you in the church. But also, learn from this role. Um, okay, so we are not elders. Actually, I am an elder. Um, I'm an elder at Calvary Presbyterian Church, but most of you are probably not elders. But that doesn't matter. Um, if even if you're not an elder, you can still learn from the role of elders and, uh, I guess, participate in Christ's uh, mission in the same way. Um, basically, you can pray, you can take part in the ministry of the word, and you can lead. So, um, first, prayer. Verse 4, the apostles say, But we will devote ourselves to prayer 
and to the ministry of the word. Which I think is so cool um, because when we think of ministry or of service, a lot of times we think of doing stuff, um, organizing, planning, talking to people, um, you know, speaking, um, things like that. We think of doing stuff. But the apostles knew that about half of what they were called to is just prayer. <laughs> um, all of our doing stuff doesn't do anything unless God does it. And so the first thing we're called to is just to pray. Um, and then you are called to the ministry of the word. You know, as you uh, maybe teach the kids in your, um, you know, in your churches, like you're doing the ministry of the word. Uh, you should go on this summer project if you can, if you have free time this summer, because they will teach you how to do evangelism. They will teach you how to do the ministry of the word. Uh, and then finally, leadership. Like, you guys are young, I'm young too. I'm, I'm an elder in the sense that I have like an official role in Christ's church, um, but I'm young. And yet, as we lead to the best of our ability, God is actually using people like us, our best efforts, to build his church. Um, so the reason we serve in all these ways, prayer, ministry of the word, and leadership, is because God is building his church. Okay, so two years ago, this guy named Zhang Yi Chen, who a lot of you guys know, started coming to our ministry at Calvary. He wasn't a Christian at all. And uh, he wanted to learn more about Christ. And so I have this book called The Walk, which I've gone through uh, with some people in our ministry. And basically it just explains who Jesus is, what he do so we can be saved, and how to walk as a follower of Jesus. And so Johnny and I started to meet weekly to go through this book. Um, and I, I realized along the way, about like week five or six, like his, his answer, let's say week two or three, he could repeat back to me what the gospel was. Week three and four, he, you know, like he was, he was understanding deeper and deeper truth about God, about the gospel, about being a follower of Jesus. He's telling you to close the door. It's okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> week three or four, he was, he was understanding more and more about, um, about the gospel, like I was saying. About week five or six, his answers to the question had become, instead of what Christians believe, to what I believe. I had seen, over the course of time, he had become a Christian. Like, I don't know when the exact moment was. He doesn't even know the exact moment. All I know is that as we continued to look at this book, The Walk, and just at what Jesus had done for him, he had become a Christian. God was building his church, and he was doing it through my simple efforts and just, like, going through this book. Anyway, this is why we serve, because God is building his church. Okay, that's elders. Next, we're going to look at deacons. Okay, so deacons take care of many of the practical needs in the church to free up the elders for their role. That's what deacons do. And we see that in this passage. Um, the, this original group of deacons... But the reason they were called to be deacons was because there was a lot to take care of. Um, you know, they were, like I said, 5,000 people had joined the church in a very short amount of time. Thousands of dollars were coming in. There was a lot of practical details, and it was distracting the apostles from their primary mission. And so the reason they are deacons is so they can take care of some of the practical needs so that the elders can focus on eldering. So in our church, and I'm sure in your church, the deacons do practical things like um, take care of the finances of the church, um, take care of the church building, um, do the newsletter, run the library, do the website, maybe pick people up for the service, um, prepare the bulls and do the slideshow. They, they take care, they serve in practical ways to free up the elders for their role. Um, next, deacons lead the church in the area of mercy ministry. And we see that in this passage. Um, you know, basically, the reason they called this group of deacons uh, was to take care of mercy ministry. Widows were being neglected, and they needed someone to manage the finances, know who was in need, and distribute the finances to the people who needed it. 
Um, and so, one of the role of deacons today is just to care for people um, inside the church. Okay, so, like I said, I, was on, I did a stint uh, with Campus Crusade in Madrid. And while I was in Madrid, I was robbed multiple times. Because um, I'm extremely white. I really think that's like the only <laughs> possible explanation of why I was robbed over and over again. Um, anyway, one of the times I was robbed, uh, these two guys followed me into my apartment building, strangled me, uh, took my backpack and all my stuff, and took my money out of my wallet, and um, left me like almost passed out on the ground. Bummer. Um, I was part of a really good church, and the deacons heard about what happened. And so during their like deacon meeting, they discussed my practical need. Um, I guess they should have gotten me a gun. Um, but instead, <laughs> they, they determined that I had lost a sufficient amount of money in this attack and like, you know, like value, valuable objects or whatever. Um, so what they determined to do was to give me 50 euros, uh, which is cool. Like, it's not like 50 euros was a make or break, you know, I actually lost more than 50 euros. Uh, but I was experiencing the practical care of Christ Church, and that's what deacons do. Uh, deacons are called to care for the people inside the ministry. And then, deacons are also called to care for people outside the ministry. Um, last summer, I got to go on a mission trip. Some of you guys got to go with me. And we went to Atlantic City, New Jersey. And we got to work with a church who's doing, they're doing some really cool stuff. Uh, one of the things they're doing is they run this Bible club um, in the poorest parts of Atlantic City, New Jersey. And all these kids come, and we put out this blue tarp, and uh, play songs, and play with the kids, and do crafts, and have a snack, and um, do a skit that teaches some Bible lesson, and someone shares their testimony, and it's a Bible club. It's fun. Um, but while they do that, all the parents, you know, obviously they don't know us, so all the parents stand around the blue tarp to make sure that their kids are, you know, okay. And as the parents stand there, the, um, the people from the church talk with the parents about what needs do you have? Um, what, what needs do you have? Like, uh, you know, does your house need to be painted? Um, you know, do you need new carpet? Uh, are you able to make rent this month? You know, stuff like that. Um, they're just trying to find out practical needs in the community from people who would never step foot inside of a church. And then they're following up on those needs. Um, the deacons. They, well, actually, I don't know if they're deacons, all right. But the church is. This is a good deacon ministry, though. Um, basically, the church is finding out practical needs in the community, the poorest parts of Atlantic City, and then they're taking care of the needs. Um, that's what deacons do. Deacons care for people inside the church and outside the church. So again... Uh, as we think about the role of deacons, the first step is just to have some. <laughs> so you should join a church. Um, have some deacons. And then you should su support them in their role. Um, maybe deacons get beat up. <laughs> um, maybe like everything gets dumped on them and everyone forgets about them. So you should encourage them and pray for them. Maybe they also, like, uh, like an ostrich, like stick their head in the sand. Like there's too many needs. They don't have enough money. They don't have enough time. They're working two jobs. Like they can't take care of all this. Maybe they need your help. Um, maybe there are ways that people in your church could be cared for better, and maybe you're the person to help your deacons see it. Um, maybe there's uh, ways that the community around your churches can be cared for better, and maybe you're the people who can help your deacons see it and, um, you know, volunteer your services um, to help them do what deacons are called to do. And then, clearly, we're supposed to do what deacons do, even if we're not deacons. Um, we're called to love and serve the people around us. And that's, like, you've known that since you were, like, four. Like, you grew up in church, I guess. Like, um, what is the greatest commandment? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And then, love your neighbor as yourself. And it's, like, so obvious, but it's so easy to forget that we are simply called to just love and serve the people around us. Like, um, some of the hardest people to love are your family, your friends, uh, your coworkers, People at your church, um, your roommates, you know, these are the hardest people to love because you see them all the time, you know all their flaws, and like they've gotten under your skin in the same ways over and over and over again. And yet, we are called to love and serve the people around us. Um, God knows all of your flaws, He knows all of my flaws, He still loved us enough to die for us, and He's called us to love and serve others. 
um, even knowing all their flaws. Why? Well, lots of good reasons. But as we love people around us, verse 7 says, the number of disciples multiplied greatly. It was as the apostles kept doing what the apostles were supposed to do, and as the deacons started serving and loving these widows, that the disciples multiplied greatly. Okay, so, like I said, I became a Christian to Campus Crusade. And it actually happened when I was a freshman in a Bible study at uh, my dorm, actually. I, I went, it's a long story, but cutting all of it, basically. Um, but I went to this Bible study, and the thing that really stuck out to me was the love of the guys for one another. Um, basically, in that Bible study, there were people who were cool, and there were people who were not cool. There were people who were dressed well, and people who were not dressed well. There were people who were socially competent, and there were people who were socially incompetent. And there was also a guy who was super weird. Um, like, I, didn't, I was brand new to the group, and I was like, that guy's super weird. <laughs> and as I got to know him well, I found out he really is super weird. <laughs> that's fine. Okay. Basically what I saw as a non-Christian, atheist at that point, what I saw was it, was, it was distinct. It was different. I don't, I don't want to say I'd never seen it, but to this point I cannot think of any other time I'd seen it. People who were loving each other, in this case they were freshman guys, so they were like wrestling around on the floor and like hugging each other and you know joking around with each other and stuff. But indiscriminately to whether they were cool or not, whether they were socially competent or not, whether they were dressed well or not, even the guy who was super weird, they were all hugging each other and wrestling and they all knew each other and they all obviously loved each other. Obviously, like even to an outsider. And when I saw that, that was like my first time that I was like, okay, what do you believe? Um, because that was different. And so, you know, I guess it's just an exhortation to you guys. Um, as you love one another, the disciples will multiply greatly, you know? Like, as people see your love for one another, <clears throat> people will want to hear what you believe. Um, anyway, a little exhortation. Where are we? How long have I been speaking, by the way? Uh, 30. Okay. One final thing from this passage. <coughs> Leaders in Christ's church are called to have good character. And we see that in this passage. Um, verse 3. Pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. So we see that these original deacons had to be people who had a good reputation among the people they were going to be leading. Makes sense. Like if, if people are going to follow them, they have to have a good reputation. Um, they had to be full of the spirit. They had to be Christians, obviously. They had to, they had to have the Holy Spirit. Um, but they also need to be full of the Holy Spirit in the sense that um, their lives were like, that the Holy Spirit had a pervasive influence over their lives. That they were Christ-centered. They were repenting of sin. They were growing. They had the fruit of the Spirit. They cared about the kinds of things that God cared about. They had to be full of the Holy Spirit. Um, and then they had to have the ability, abilities needed to serve faithfully. In this case, they had to have wisdom, and they had to have the ability to follow through on this extremely complex ministry of managing the giving from thousands and thousands of people, keeping a list of everyone who needed help, and distributing the funds, you know, as necessary. They had to have good character. And so when we hear this kind of thing, we're reminded that we are also called to have good character. Even if you're not a leader in Christ's church yet, we well, probably will be someday if you keep walking with him. Um, so go ahead and develop good character now. Um, even if you never are a leader, you're called to have good character. Um, so, you know, step up to the plate. Um, when you hear the list of good character traits that we're all supposed to have, you feel convicted, and so do I, because we don't measure up. Um, you don't, and I don't. And when we don't, it, we run to the cross. And we remember that only one person had perfectly good character. And he was treated like someone who had bad character, so that, if we place our faith in him, we can be treated and accepted as if we had good character. 
Um, but motivated by that, and empowered by the Holy Spirit, step up to the plate and grow in good character. God is building his church. Um, he's growing his church numerically by adding disciples, but he's also growing his church in character by working in us. Um, so when I became a Christian, I was discipled by this guy named Brian Evans. Um, he was one of the leaders of Bible study when I became a Christian. Brian Evans had, had also been an atheist before he became a Christian. And he was also a big drinker. And he was also had a terrible temper. And so he told me, you know, at least one story. Oh, well, it is hot in here. Um, he told me about how he got drunk and, like, beat up this guy apart. But then he became a Christian. And as he walked with Jesus for a long time, well, one, he gave up his drinking. At least he didn't get drunk. No, he didn't get drunk anymore. Um, and two, his anger problem was resolved. And now he's actually <coughs> serving as a full-time missionary in Rome, and um, and he's leading this mercy ministry to uh, refugees from the Middle East and Africa. Here's my point: you have hope for your character flaws. Um, as you continue to walk with Jesus, God is building His church. He's building His church numerically, but He's also building his church in character uh, by growing you and by growing me. So as the apostles continue to pray and teach and lead, and as the um, new deacons took care of the practical needs of the ministry and cared for people both inside and outside the ministry, God was building his church. Verse 7, And the word of God continued to increase, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. Um, so at Calvary, where I'm a pastor, we have seen recently an awesome example of God building his church. And it's, this is a girl, Claire. Um, Claire was an atheist. She was, she's, she's from China. Um, she moved to the United States like eight years ago or something like that, with her husband. Um, but and she, you know she has a really good education. Um, she has she had a really good career, but she was plagued by the meaninglessness of life, and so she started to wonder if God was the answer. Then she saw a poster uh, advertising our ministry, and she called and she came, and she loved the message of hope in the gospel, and so she kept coming. She's been coming for three months now, um, and. One of the girls in our ministry started to meet up with her weekly to go through the walk, the book I was talking about earlier. Um, she started going to a Chinese language Bible study as well. Um, she came to our membership class and um, shared her testimony of how she'd come to understand the gospel and trusted in Jesus Christ. God added her to his church. And what I love about that story is if you think about it, um, think of all the people involved. First, someone had to serve in a really practical way of making a poster. Um, someone made a poster. His name is Chris. Uh, and then someone had to hang up the poster. His name was Jungi. Um, when she came to the ministry, she especially connected with uh, Weenie, with Linda, with Deborah. And then Weenie started meeting up with her weekly. Not because Weenie's awesome, but just because Weenie wanted Claire to know Jesus. Um, and there's also you know, other people involved, uh, myself, and this um, Chinese-speaking uh, Bible study. My point is, God was using the, the simple service of a lot of different people to build his church. It was God who brought Claire to himself. Um, and that's why we serve. That's why we serve, because God is building his church. And so, um, just a final closing thought. Um, have you joined his church? Um, again, God is building his church through the simple gospel of Jesus Christ. Have you transferred your trust um, from everything else? Like, where's your, uh, where's your hope? Where is your ultimate value in life? What's most important to you? What has the ability to dictate everything else in your life? Transfer your trust from school, from friendships, from dating relationships, from a successful career, from everything else to Jesus Christ. 
He is the one who can reconcile you to God. He is the one who loved you enough to die for you. And if you place your faith in him, you are reconciled to the God of the universe. Um, place your faith in him, walk with him for the rest of your life, and God has added you to his church. Um, so let me go ahead and close us in prayer. God, thank you again for the opportunity to hang out with these awesome people. God, I pray that, uh, as I've been talking about, that you would take these simple words and accomplish your kingdom work in them. Uh, God, I pray that you know, you bring people to faith in you if they have not yet come to faith in you. As people who, um, whose faith is in you, God, give them hope again. Um, give them hope again that they can grow, and give them hope again that you can do awesome things through their service. God, um, just help us to know you and um, transfer our trust from everything else to you. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks.